want to talk about uh, the business situation. Uh, I've got this survey from the uh, the traditional trade publication, Replay Magazine. The August issue just put out uh, their survey of game operators. And today, we're mostly going to talk about this column over on the left here. That's the scenario where there is a location involved that has some other business they are doing, and they have an operator come in and bring in coin-up games, and we hope pinball. So remember, Replay is a magazine for operators, not just pinball people, and so they're asking the operators, what kinds of equipment do you put out on your locations? sometimes called street locations. Uh, and top of the list is pool tables. And I can say from my days of operating back in the 70s, that makes economic sense because it, it costs less to buy. There is some maintenance when you refelt it, but it, you know you learn how or whatever. And, and it's just going in a place where it's likely to stay there, you know, got to be a room that's got enough pre-COVID. Yeah, open space to... <laughs> Pre-COVID they stayed close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get closer to them. And so that, for decades, has been like the standard of earnings in the sense of a steady game that you put it out and stays out and money comes in every week, and the maintenance is very predictable. Now, if you know anything about the history of coin up, probably the first thing you learn is that in the 80s, there was some upheaval where suddenly pinball went way down because video games just sort of displaced it, and video games have such low maintenance. And for a time, they make spectacular money. Uh, and that rates slightly before below pool in the operator survey even now, where I guess now we'd be saying uh, video games for street locations is Big Buck Hunter and uh, Silver Strike Bowling and Golden Tee Golf, the evergreen titles at Renew, and then uh, we'll talk more about other uh, like remade classics or whatever you have. Cranes. Cranes on location. You know, we just pluck the prize out of there and slightly below that 82 percent of operators say they run pinball and I think 20 years ago that was probably more like 40 percent so I, I think we've had a, a really good resurgence uh, out in locations out on the street that operators realize that pinball is is good for them and plus retaining its value you know unlike some video games they, d they don't just go down to be worthless uh, and below that darts uh, ATMs not really a game let's hope and uh, below that uh, your basketball tosser games air hockey foosball which was important when I was operating in, in the 70s uh, around uh, seacoast area of New Hampshire hot foosball area um, so it's good news that pinball is doing well. But in, uh, Dave Medor, in your uh, route, what do you think uh, of, of the games that you say, I've, I've got a new location, uh, it's going to be small, you know, not, not a lot of games, so I can't kind of cover my possibilities by having a lot of games. I've got to pick something. What's... What's your probably a core go-to game in a bar or something like that? I was going to say, well, first I'm going to look at the audience as to what they have. Um, one of the things you didn't mention in there that's a big staple in my business is actually the music, the jukeboxes, touch tunes. Yeah, jukeboxes, well, that's huge. that's off the top of the scale. I didn't even bother yeah, mentioning that, that one's way up there. But then, you know, I'd look at the space. Does a pool table even make sense? Yes, no. Cranes, you know, depending on, is it a family place? Is it a family-friendly pub? Or is this more a bar where it's going to be a 21 and up crowd and that's all you're going to see? Um, that dictates whether like, a crane will kill it in the locations where there's a lot of kids. A crane will do okay with an, okay, with an adult crowd. 
Um, pinballs are going to do a lot better in crowds where there's going to be a good chunk of adults. Um, but then again, so will games like Buck Hunter and Golden Sea. Yeah, so, so you see, here's a, a real-world perspective that pinball, for us, is like a very special kind of coin-op game, but when you're out there trying to make a living, you have to balance things off. And uh, Brian McCauley, uh, what are you seeing out there for the, the smaller type street locations? The small type street locations, um, pinball, um, we, we see a lot of that. Um, we focus on a lot of video games in our locations. Same thing like with Dave, Big Buck Hunter, um, we put into ball into bars as well. Okay, and uh, any other, like a, let's say a non-networked, like plunk it down, standalone, upright video game that's a... We run everything from the 80s. We do Pac-Mans. We do the yeah. anniversary editions and stuff like that in the smaller locations. Um, again, right now there's a big demand. We see a big influx of people asking for pinball machines because they see it's growing and what have you. Um, so that's one of the key things. Again, video games, um, you know, you don't usually put a, a crane or anything like that in a bar location. So it's, you yeah. know. I've also seen a resurgence in a lot of people wanting specific classic games. Like they want, they don't want a Pac-Man remake. They want a Pac-Man or they want a Miss Pac-Man. They want the legit one. Can you change out the CRT for a flat screen? Yes. Yeah, they they don't have a problem with that as long okay. as it looks good. But I mean, they really want the feel and the nostalgia of playing what they played when they were kids. Yeah. A lot of places are really pushing for that. And I think that's what helps pinball is because they remember playing pinball made not necessarily like the Stern titles or the Jersey Jack titles that we have now, but they remember playing pinball as a game. And I think it helps. I mean, then you have themes like what they're coming out with where the license stuff is... Yeah, the license pushes... ...is it. something that really pushes it along. Mm-hmm. All right, so, uh, so neither of you mentioned uh, the more physical games like... Uh, a toss or a rolling type of game? Is so we have um, a couple of our locations. We have Connect Four, which is a basketball game. It's a dual player. One of the things you get to watch out in a bar environment is they are loud. Um, so a lot of times the bar operators won't opt for something like that. Um, so we're very um, cautious on doing that. We have one location where we have a Connect Four. We also have a large the, um, uh, ice basketball. Um, and they do, um, we do see that they do well in that environment. They do produce quite a bit of revenue. Hmm. And say you were focused on the small locations, and yeah, you're looking at start. some of these places, like small locations, like 10 feet for a ski ball is a lot of space, you know. 10 yeah. feet you can do a lot more with than you can with one ski ball. You can put one ski ball with three games. Yeah. You know, you've got chances are and, you're going to earn more with three pieces than you will with a single ski ball. Right, and you as an operator first had to convince the location owner that the 10 feet or whatever is better with your games than a couple more tables of dining or so drinking. We just had that happen at one of the locations that we're opening. Um, the owners asked us, you know, come in do an evaluation, and we were talking about putting one of these brand new Connect 4s in. And one of the things was they had eight seats in the corner where this game would go. And the two owners are going back and forth arguing about it. And finally I had to, you know, talk to them and tell them, you know, you get eight seats, figure your turnover and what that money's going to make you per night. Whereas this video game or this basketball game, that's going to be played from open to close because of where the location is, a steady stream of people. The other thing that was sort of a, a caveat with that is they weren't allowed to advertise this location where this machine's 12 feet tall, it's neon, looks beautiful. Mm. You can see it from the outside, so it's basically free advertising for them. The two partners looked at each other like, it's case solved, get rid of the chairs, put the video game, put the Connect Four in. Yeah, that, that brings up another interesting thing. In uh, more of a FEC or a game room type situation, there's definitely a lot of tall pieces. So the Airspace Invaders is the, the big one yes. where you're sitting back with the guns and... Uh, um, I happen to like Fishbowl Frenzy because it's it's a pin and ball game, right? You're dropping a ball and it's bouncing among, among some pins, and I think that's like eight feet tall without the topper. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but does that fit through a normal door? 
um, it will fit through. Uh, no, it, yeah. it will not. So, so that's advantage <laughs> pinball right there is that it, it will ha- fit through the door. I have to be careful how I answer that because of if you want to spend the time to take it apart, anything will fit through a door. But you got to think you got to reassemble that. So a lot of times that when we're deciding at a location, that's the key. What can we fit through the door? A lot of these places are a 36 inch, you know, standard door. You got to go with that and figure out what put you it, can fit. Uh, put it this way to expand on what he's saying: Jurassic Park environmental shooter, pretty really good size game, right? I put that through a 34 inch door opening. <laughs> They, they, in seven pieces, <laughs> they come. Up, they do come apart. So we have a um, King Kong, which is the new VR game that was released about a year, year and a half ago. It is massive, and we fit one through a 36, and it just it disassembles into panels. But again, it's 12 hours to put it back together. It comes apart real easy, but going back together, it's a 12-hour process. Okay, so. That's some perspective, and we can take some questions later on if you want to get more into the game mix. I will be returning to the topic of the game mix also, but uh, quoting now from this August uh, 2023 Replay magazine, we also specifically asked what type of pinball machines operators had. About 48% said they have a mix of retro and new, while 30% had only newer, uh, smaller group only retro, and then, of course, there's the 18% who, ah, pinball, yeah, no, no pinball. And, and I did uh, have some contact with a, a mystery operator. Uh, I will only call her Miss V, and Miss V has been operating for a long time, uh, also somewhere in the New England region. And uh, no pinball, not, not that she dislikes it, but just the kind of bars she has. You know, they get stuck on one thing, and I think she's more happy to have replaced uh, a puck bowler with a physical puck by now, a silver strike bowling and virtual type of bowling. Uh, But what do you see for retro pinballs? So, you know, we, like Dave said earlier, we look at what the clientele coming in is going to be. Um, if we're going into a small bar where we're going to have one or two pins, we want to have a playable pin. So we look more toward the Stearns, the Jersey Jack, or American uh, Chicago. Um, if it's something where we're going to have a lot of pins, we have one location that's got nine pins in it, and we mix. And the majority of it are the nostalgia, older 80 pins and the 90 pins. We get a Mount of Harry in this bar. We have a Kiss mm-hmm. and a couple others. Um, and the mix, it does well. I mean, people come in, again, they, the nostalgia. We used to play this when we were a kid. And they really, it really, really works well doing the, t- the two eras. Yeah. Um, I have two different locations that have more than a few pins. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is more focused around kids. And I find that IP, more than anything in that type of a place, is what drives the sales. So it doesn't matter sometimes whether it's new or old, um, put it blankly. Uh, I put a brand new Ninja Turtles in, thinking, oh my god, it's going to light the world on fire. Great theme. It couldn't beat my Super Mario Brothers Gottlieb. Huh. But the same thing happened the other way around when I put in Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy was the highest earning one there for quite some time. But again, it was popular, IP, fun game. Um, It also tends in that location, it has to be a little bit easier, and I think the biggest problem with Turtles is it is a little bit more of a difficult game for the little kids to follow. Whereas Guardians, they can pretty much shoot group, get multi-ball, and figure it out. Um, At the other location, they do league matches, they do tournaments, and I find that place works best if there's some sort of a mix, because if you get too many modern games with ball saves with lots of multi-ball, with lots of features, game times tend to run long with good players, whereas some of the older games tend to speed up the tournament a little bit. Mm. Okay, well that that sort of pivots us over to, there is a special class of location, and if we had Mitch Curtis here, we could talk in greater depth, but I think you guys can represent what Mitch does. Uh, So some locations are advertising as 
a great pinball destination that they hope all of you guys will find out about through pinballmap.com or whatever, and that people will come from tens of miles away because there are so many great pinball machines there. Uh, and we seem to be able to have quite a few of them in the New England area. We had mention of Pizza J earlier. Uh, last night, there was, we showed the movie uh, Token Taverns that showed a lot of uh, places in Florida that were all very close to each other. That They seem to all be able to coexist. And... Uh, up and up and down the coastline, uh, and you know, apart from the pay by the hour places, but the coin drop type, multi pin locations. So uh, each of you, Dave, you've already started to talk about your multi pin locations. Brian, do you have a, a showcase of your best multi pin? This we have a, a location in Amesbury. Um, we have nine pins in that location. Um, they're a mix between Stearns and um, mostly Williams and Bally, 90 errors. Um, the, it seems, um, and now we're talking the aspect of the coin drop location. Right, I meant, you know, in general that you pay per game as opposed to per hour, whether it's a real coin or a... Oh, we're using, yeah, we're, uh, in that location we're using coin drop, absolutely. Yep. Okay, so you have some sense that people are coming in and maybe not going to come back you know, like they're just passing through. Yes. A, yeah, transient kind of audience. Dave, anything further to say about your multi-pin location? No. Uh, well, one of them's on a card reader system. One of them's on a coin system. And um, the benefit of the card reader system is you can see live data. Yeah. Um, but that's the nice thing I've seen with Stern system is I can see on a given day how many plays. I can also get tech reports before I even walk in there to know I'm about to walk into a problem. Hmm. So, you could, in, you could theoretically monitor your pins on your swipe card, or on your well, insider, no, insider connected. Insider you want to, you prefer insider connected. Ins insider actually on the professional route location side. So if you're a location, you can actually get like, if a switch doesn't, if you have a switch problem. Okay, it'll so actually more pop detail. Up, a tech alert will pop up on my phone. I click on it. It'll tell me switch 57 error. Okay, yeah. that's So that's I already can yeah, look yeah. in the book, figure out which switch that is, bring one with me, go to the location, fix it, which is, you know, when you're on the road, huge. Right. But that, so the swipe card is only going to be talking swipe about Swipe card's how only going to tell me how much money and when yeah, it went in. Yeah, well, the okay. other thing, too, is we... But it doesn't jam. We use the card system a little bit different at some of our locations. Um, some of our locations actually report to us. Um, they can go in when they shut a machine down. They can go in and comment, and they'll tell us. A lot of it's more redemption. We do have a few redemption locations with pins. They can go in and they can tell us, uh, customer complained of the pop bumper is not working. So for remotely again, I can go in, I can turn that machine on, I can turn it off remotely, I can turn around, you know, see what's logged, and when I get there, go in, do the repair, go into the card system, shut it down. So it is a, a communication network like Star and Connect. Um, Stern Connect just gives you more detail of specific what the I, I think what the um, issues are. With the card system, you're relying on somebody who you hope knows a little bit about what they're doing and what they type in. Okay, um, seems like a good point to see if anyone wants to ask a question right now. Because I'm going to do a little pivot. Uh, okay, Derek here has a question. Check. Oh, it's working. Uh, Brian, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, what would you like to see from Stern Pinball in support of their Spike One games uh, with their node boards, like node board number eight? Yep. Uh, and maybe, I, I don't know, maybe it's question number two, which is um, in relation to Spike Three upcoming, uh, maybe better support nodes? I'm not sure. So the, um, the conversation Derek and I we were having was, so we have a couple, I also do pinball service in lieu of what I do uh, for repairs in doing uh, locations. And one of the things we're seeing is with Stern, it's not Stern specific, um, other companies are doing it, but their node boards are becoming game specific. So just to give you an example, we have two Ghostbusters right now with the node 8B board that's down. 
you cannot buy them in the United States right now. You cannot buy them. The only place we could find them is Australia. By the time we landed, it's seventy dollars in shipping plus the part. Um, so this is a concern as an operator or doing service in the field. We have these machines that we're putting out. Again, I don't want to say specific to Stern. It's a lot of vendors that are doing this. When you have a machine that's starting to age, that's two, three years old, we like to keep these older machines going because customers like older machines as well. We're finding that we've got to put these games idle because we just can't get those boards. So I'd like to see the spike system, you know, somehow, whether it's a third party or what have you, generate more boards and replacement boards so we can keep these machines running. Like I said, we've got two gorgeous um, Ghostbusters. We can't get a node board eight, uh, a node board 8B for, and it's just it really hampers putting machines on location. So another one of those day-to-day -day concerns. Yes. Uh, and are are your roots growing in general? First, we'll talk in general, then we'll talk pinball. Yes. Um, we we do different, um, with what I handle, we do different various routes. We have bowling alleys, we have bars, um, we have family entertainment centers, and you know, we, we always meet with our owners and they turn around and they keep asking, can we do more, can we fit more? You know, there's pros and cons when you're going into a location. We have one location right now that has 30 machines, mix of redemption, vending, pinball, and they're always asking, oh, we need more games easy for them to say, it, right? It is, because, you know, you're talking between seven and depending what the machine is, right now you can go up to $80,000 for one of the new VR machines. Uh, we just put a super bike in and it was seventy six grand for them to install it. And So, you know, when a company comes up to you and they say, or the owner comes up and says, oh, we want this, we want this, we got to look at the foot traffic and what it does. So this location, we keep telling them, we can put 100 machines in your location, you don't have the foot traffic to support it. So that really makes it, you know, a challenge. But we try our best. We try to beat what the opera is. But as for growing, yes, and, you know, I, I don't want to let too much out of the bag. For, but w just to give you an idea, one company that I'm working for right now is expanding. We have three new locations opening in the next three months. And I'm talking locations that are 20 machines and greater, um, which we'll talk about, we'll announce yeah. later. But so the industry is growing in New England, what we see. Yeah, I have a quote here. David Jackson, president of Action Jackson Amusements, you know, famous big operator. Uh, been in business around 50 years, 350 locations, 1,400 pieces out, and he says, I'm still growing. Yeah. And Dave, how about you? It, it's a business where you're always trying to grow, expand, find new ways. I mean, let's face it, some of the businesses that you're in, they go under they go away okay so you're constantly trying to find new ones coming in new new avenues for expansion things you, people might not have thought of um, but like he said you got to be careful the hard part is you know you'll have a place to say I want 25 brand new games right yeah well when you want 25 brand new games and they're 15 20 thirty thousand dollars a pop but you only have you know 250 people in your location at a given time yeah. Well, it's great that you want 25 pieces, but it, I don't see where that's going to help me any. One thing Besides a big bill. One yeah. thing that I'm going to add on here, because I know everybody's thinking, oh, you're an operator, you're taking all this money in. A lot of people miss, lose sight of, you're not taking all that money in. Yeah, it's divided up It's here. divided up, and we were talking, Dave and I have very good communications in our two different businesses. We have locations that there are 30, 70, which is 70% um, the operator, 30% the business. It is starting to change. And when I said this earlier yeah. today, everybody looked at me. We have locations that are asking us to do the reverse. Do 30 us and 70 them. 30 for the operator. 30 for the operator and 70 for... And, and yeah. the reason being is the businesses are getting cocky. They're seeing the 50-50 or the 60-40 split and thinking, oh, I can do this myself. Well, they seem to forget a couple <laughs> things. They don't have to invest $100,000 right off the bat for their location. They don't have to find a tech. I don't know any of you who have looked for a tech. It's hard to find an arcade tech right now. So you bring this all up and you get the deer in the headlights there. Oh, yeah. okay, you know, we'll give you the set. We can't give you the 30-70 split, but that's what they're asking right now, some of the locations. I've Again, because it's easy to, to say. I haven't yeah. that too much so far, but 
and we should give the locations. Dave is more of a from southern mid Maine up north, and where I'm more based southern Maine down to Boston um, is what I cover. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a different market, but again, where the market's hot, like a Boston market, the operator, the owners are seeing this, and they're like, well, why do I have to give you this? And you always have to come up and tell them. Well, this is why you're paying me or he's doing yeah. something. Well, what about, what about rotation for that matter? If it's a pinball-centric place and they want to have 10 pinball machines, so there's going to be some older ones, wouldn't they want to see a variety of not just the newest ones coming in when they can, but also some older ones that are different older ones? Well, this is where the other catch is. You always have to have an arsenal of machines. So one of the companies that I work for, we have a, a good size shop. We always have six machine, pinball machines that are ready to go in rotation. But throughout the course of a month, we are always rotating our pinball machines around because of you got to have a fresh variety. People come in. We have one location in central Bo in central Boston. There's six machines, and the players come and tell us, "Hey, Jurassic Park's been here. It's growing dust, and we have to rotate them out and get something fresh in there." I'm um, as for new machines again because of, you know the cost of pinball machines are going just like everything else. They're rising. Um, you know, a location says, "Oh, can we get the latest greatest? We got a Venom coming, and we can't wait. We're dying for our lo uh, Venom to come in." A and the, that's what they're, these locations are demanding of the newer machines. So, but the hard part that really hasn't changed, especially in pinball, you know, eighty-six pinball. Would you pay fifty cents for a play? Per play? Per play? Okay. Uh, so in the nineties, would you pay for an Adams Family? Okay. What in what in that span of time didn't increase besides pinball? Besides arcade games. Everything else went up. Okay, so let's fast forward in like 2000s. <laughs> they finally get to what, 75? Now you're finally up to a buck in, you know, 2020, 2019, 2018, we're on a dollar. Yeah, or with a card and swipe. And you people, could be. people were sitting there going, I, can't, I don't can't believe you got to pay a dollar to play a pinball machine. And I'm like, okay, but when you take that dollar, you split it out, we're not getting but like 50, 60 cents of that dollar. Pinball yeah. machines, you know, when we were getting, when you were selling them for 50 cents a play, you were talking a $2,000 machine. Yep. yep. Now you're trying to get a dollar a play on a 70, what's pro now, 7400 bucks. So, you know, companies all, the, it, when you're looking at an amusement company, an operator, Everything's ROI, which is return on investment. I don't care who you are. If you're in business, those are three letters you always have. And if you take yeah, what you we, get... We will cycle back to that for sure. Uh, we have a question over oh. here. <coughs> uh, possible ringer in the audience, but <laughs> let's let him ask his question. Hello, everyone. Uh, Michael Green here, Senior Manager of Location Entertainment for Stern Pinball. Just want to add some color to what uh, these gentlemen are, are saying. Some, uh, when you hear some objections from locations about about revenue split and, and I just add some color to that. So, you know, from Stern Pinball's point of view, you know, we work with professional operators on a day-to-day -day basis and work with them to, to help improve their route and uh, in their relationship with locations. You know, we, we're currently encouraging uh, pinball operators 80-20 split, 70-30 split, something like that in favor of the operator. And what you're doing by bringing pinball and other games, other uh, uh, games is you're enhancing the elev you're enhancing the entertainment experience for one. Uh, if you're using Stern pinball games and you have them connect the insider connected, you also have insider connected math, which is also drawing players to the location. And something called utility, where you're in, you know seats in the stools. You're there. You're getting people in the in the uh, place to play pinball, but they stay for the food and the drink. And if you're if you're organizing tournaments once a month yeah, you get or, that. Uh, and beyond, you know, stuff like that. You can strategically schedule them on slower nights uh, and increase those food and incremental food and beverage sales. Uh, so, and also the social media aspect to it, you, know, you, you can separate yourself from the competition. You can use, you know, you sometimes you see like um, breweries and cider cades, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll announce a new beer or a new product or a new breakfast item and they've got the pinball of the other games in the background. And it's just, it's almost subconscious, like, wow, this place looks hip, I should really check it out. So you're, it's not just about coin draw. You're really, you're, you're, you're really helping 
little bit. Okay, let's let's, the let's run with that because that's the next thing I wanted to get to. Uh, and it would it would have helped if Mitch were here, but uh, I think we'll fill in for him. So, so you say there's an operator that's dominantly pinball, but if if he's taking it upon himself to be the showrunner or something like he's he's not just putting the games there and coming back every week to collect the money he's actually saying I'm going to push for the league to be here and uh, so in the survey of the operators there they're talking about that not just for pinball of course pool uh, whatever bowling type machine uh, darts darts were like nothing when I was an operator until someone said we're going to do dart leagues and then darts were something foosball you know leagues help a lot there too so that must be part of Mitch's magic formula I guess yes yes <laughs> so it's just like anything else when you're in a location I used to manage a bar years and years ago and I used to bring an, oper an operator who supplied me with a we had a pinball two pinball machines and a video game and um, it did good, just like a dart league. Uh, we used to have just a small tournament, like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. And it's bringing customers into your bar. You advertise it a little bit, and you know, usually people come in. You'll bring in eight to twelve people, and it is a revenue stream. So I, I don't want to, you know, say it's not. Um, one of the things that we see is a lot of times, and and Mike Michael's comment was part of like Insider Connect. We know because we're in the business. You have to sell that. Um, I think Inside of Connect is fantastic. Um, I love everything it does. It does advertise for the, the operation, but you have to sell that. A lot of these op these people who are owners, they don't care. All they want to see is this is the coin drop. But what are you giving me for a check at the end of the month? That's all they're interested. So, yeah. and in Mitch case, in Mitch's case, um, you know, there's a difference. So Dave operates. I repair. I don't have locations that I operate. I do repairs for other operators. Um, it's hard, and I do a lot of their um, estimating. I do a lot of their, um, I go in and I do um, consulting for them. So it's hard when you see, um, you know, the customer will ask, um, what are you going to do for me? So where <laughs> I was going with this, Mitch turns around, he has a unique niche with his machines. He goes in, he maintains, I mean, Mitch is at his locations once or twice, I should say every other day, he's waxing, washing, he's doing maintenance. Um, and Mitch has four locations right now? I guess that's what we've been yeah, tossing around, Mitch, but right, I don't right, know He's got another directly. one. Unfortunately, he's not here to announce it, but he's got another yeah. one that's coming up. Um, he's able to maintain and do this passionate love he has for pinball. It's hard when you're like Dave, an operator, or myself. Dave, how many locations do you run right now? 62. Okay. So with my business, I'm a lot less than you. I'm actually about 34 that I, that I manage or I maintain. So for me to go to a location, I do hit all my locations once a week. Um, my son Joshua, who's in the audience, he cleans, he does what have you. We go on like pin map and we watch things and you know, you'll always have the individual who'll say, oh well, I went to, um, let's say, I'm gonna use a fake name, Stern Village. The machine was a mess, what have you. As an operator, it's hard for you to get in, you know, often twice, one more than once a week. Where Mitch is there, so that just shows you more of a, a dedicated pin operator. Um, we go in once a week to all our locations that have pins. They're cleaned, they're novus, they're waxed, they're maintained. Um, but again, you can see where you have a dedicated person who specializes in pin. The quality, and, and I hate to say it this way, but it is, it's life. The quality is better with yeah. someone who's and, and some of you may be thinking of doing something like this. Uh. We'll try to address that possibility in a minute. Uh, Dave, do you have any comments along those lines? Like, I, I don't think you have time to be the ambassador of pinball and, you know, run the leagues yourself or anything. So you're just... I say, that's usually my headache. I know I could make more with pinball. Absolutely could if I could push leagues, have the social media presence and do all that. But trying to run and keep up with 62 locations, make sure every piece of equipment runs in every one of them. And we're talking things from like Redemption Arcades, 
Uh, we're talking jukeboxes. We're talking pool tables. Video games. And we're talking, you know, two and a half hours drive from my house in either direction. Yeah. So, I mean, put it this way. I got a truck in June. From June till now, I've put 9,500 miles on that truck. Hmm. All in service work. Because it's the only thing it works for. Okay. So, but you... Uh you would be willing to cooperate with leagues or oh, a, a, league, a pinball what, what activist. I really, what I would really benefit from is one person that literally just wants to be the social media go to, the hype person. You know, hypes up the location, pushes pushes the product, brings value to whichever location it is. I would absolutely benefit from that, and I think that I can get locations to do a little bit of that, but I'm going to have to give up some percentage because. They're not going to give me 80% if I'm not bringing in the money if they're doing the work. Yeah, and the, uh, it certainly seems more feasible for the operator to try and either be the pinball activist or find the pinball activist. I mean, some people probably open a bar thinking, I'm going to have a great pinball location. Then they go to one of you guys and they say, you want me to spend, uh, you know, $250,000 filling up your room with pinball and you have no idea whether it's going to work or not? So one thing that w when I go into a location, our Bo Boston location is a good example. We rely on New England pinball a lot. Um, we ask them because they're the, the league or what have you. Um, we send people, you know, I, uh, like um, Nicole Bernie and a couple others, we ask them to go in and basically, you know, talk to the bar owners or the managers. Um, usually you don't have an owner on location. Usually it's a GM or a manager. And we ask them to go in, you know, this bar is a good league bar. Can you go in and talk to them? Once the owners find out that they're not responsible for being there league night and, or the GM, and it can basically run itself through a New England pinball or a league organization, usually the locations will jump right on it. Um, they usually will allow, they, they have a good time and they invite it. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the things that puzzles me because, and, and we saw it in the movie last night, uh, Token Taverns, there, I mean, a person's opening a bar, they want to have an entertainment spot, they want to pick the right bartenders and serve the cool beers that people really want to try. And, and so... Why wouldn't they also be that enthusiastic about whatever kind of coin-up games they have, be they pinball or whatever? What they? Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna be. I mean, they're gonna want, they're gonna want the top end stuff. They're gonna want the nice stuff, the new stuff. Um, but it's. Like, like you said, it's got to be feasible and work on yeah. both sides. And, and they don't well, want... Well, yeah, but couldn't you, couldn't you say in a contract negotiation, if, if you had a contract for your location, couldn't you say, not only are we expecting you, location, to provide us with electricity and some square footage, which has been the traditional, but we also want you to do this, this, and this on social media where you mention pinball and Absolutely. we want you to do this and this and uh, every print ad you ever run has to say that there's games in there and well, you know put that in the contract what are the issues that you're having especially in the bar and restaurant industry you can't really push it on them right they are so short staffed that asking a bartender to do social media stuff when they're you know they probably should have five and they get three and they can't keep up with the drink sales one of the managers aren't going to be on board with that. One of the companies that I work for um, is a large company. Um, it's Big Night Entertainment. They're out of Boston. And, you know, you go in and you try to sell them on it. They don't want anything to do with it. This, if, if you want to do a league in one of our locations, it's on your own. You bring, so as an operator and as somebody who services many locations, it's real high. I don't have the time to sit and run a league on a Tuesday night, so you get to rely on the leagues that are already out there and ha ask them to come in. Hey, this is a, again, like I said earlier, this is a great bar. They get eight pinball machines. They want to do a league, and usually most of these um, leagues come in with open arms. They want to support. They want locations, and they will come out and and do you know run the league for the location. It's just you got to have that connection. You got to be the one that builds that bridge. Um, again, and I hate to sound so black and white, <laughs> owners don't want to invest the time to do this, so they try to put it off on you, and when you suggest it, you have to own it. If you don't own it, it's not going to happen. Hmm. Do you have another question here? 
I have two quick questions. Um, one is just a really quick question. Do you guys have contracts, especially so in bars, if there is damage to the machine that's outside of standard maintenance that they pay for it? Sounds like a game owner who was thinking about putting your game on location. Well, I did, and uh, uh, somebody hit the back glass. And okay, just so damage to the games on location. Damage to games on location. Um, we so the companies that I work for carry insurance on all their games. They also the actual locations carry insurance also. The problem is is just like any other insurance, you're going to have what we call casual damage. Um, yeah. Connect Four is a good example. We have a Connect Four in Boston. Somebody got overzealous, took a skee ball ball and did the loft into the 60 inch plasma screen and. Unfortunately, it doesn't meet the, meet the deductible. That's on the operator. And the operator that I worked for to replace that, he ended up eating that TV. Um, same thing with back glasses. Uh, we had a wave, a real weird wave in Boston where they were popping flipper buttons out of pinball machines or taking a key and popping the actual button out. That's stuff we <laughs> eat. You, yep. you just, that's not something you can go to your insurance company. Um, that's a constant. I mean, it's sort of like a, a wash. It's something that we take and we, we work with. We Another thing that will happen, and I've seen it with just about every game, is any place you have kids or whatever else, expect that you're going to see sometimes they're going to carve into the side of games or somebody's going to get their hands on a nice black permanent marker and right on the side of your game. Yep. Um, you know, okay. that type of stuff's going to happen. And, and you guys just eat all of that stuff? Yep, pretty much. It's one of the reasons we have to put the percentage in a favor that's in our favor because damages, maintenance, and repairs come out of our budget. You know, I'm going to give another push to Mitch. It's a passion of love, it, like having a pinball bar like Mitch supports. It really is because you don't factor in a vehicle cost, your time, insurance, the losses, general maintenance, anything you do, that's on that person who owns those machines. So that's, I mean, it's a, la it's a labor of love. Yeah, so how does that scale down to someone uh, like Gabe who's got maybe three or four games to spare? Like he doesn't want to put out tens of games, maybe just a handful. Uh, so he's, he's got less liability in the sense of how much damage could occur with just those few games. But uh, is, is the numbers just not working out when you have that few? I think it, on, a, on a location when it comes to PIN, um, again, you get a factor in your loss, your maintenance and all that. So, you know, a lot of people come to me, oh, the money must be great. If you look at it, it isn't. I mean, a lot of times it's a negative, it's a loss, it's a write-off on a pin, and I'm talking pinball, because, you know, I'm going to go to back to what David said about what you're charging for pinball. Right now, the average price is a dollar a play. Um, we have locations that push a dollar fifty. We had one location down south in Foxborough where we were in a very prominent area. We were able to bring pinball up to $2 a play for three balls. The operator who owned the location asked me, hey, you know, I'm going to go up to two fifty, And I was like, you're crazy. I said, two fifty. So we went at $2. It was very successful. Um, it was a coin drop, and it was always the, the coin box every week was full. Um, when he went to two fifty, it stopped. I mean, it, the brakes were applied in the coin box. So we know regular locations, 75 cents to a dollar, real good, elaborate locations, you could push $2, and it's a one-time deal. You're not going to have people who play pinball on a regular basis. It's a, I'm here on vacation, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to drop, you know, the coin, and that's it, it's going to be one game. So, you know, it's really hard to say, oh, you're going to make a lot of money, you get a factor in what we said earlier, the insurance splits and what have you. So you're not going to make a ton of money. Yeah. Really I'll tell you um, from somebody that did exactly that, that's what I've done. That's why uh, we don't make the insurance money every month yet, but this is only a third month. Oh. So uh, there is no split to make yet because in our contract, we do actually have to pay the insurance and the registration costs and then the split. So we will get to that split, but not yet cross my fingers. On the play pricing, if you had the swipe cards, then you can do things like $1.37 or, or, you know, yes. the Dave and Buster's trick of you get 
each game costs 50 points, but how much, how many pennies per point, and you just can't do all the math, and so. And that's a real hot, we use, and Dave does as well, so we use a lot of card systems in our locations. Um, one of the things that we find is um, some locations use 10 cents as a marker, some use a quarter, so one location that I service, you go up and it's three credits, and everybody's like, oh, your price is real cheap. Well, no, because it's each credit is a quarter. Another location that I that I work at turns around and they charge seven cents, and people are like, oh my God, that's so much. It's seventy cents because they're based on a ten cent per credit. So there's a lot of back and forth. Right, and that. and uh, tomorrow uh, we'll be talking a little bit with the uh, Glimmerhold people. They're they're going with a high price token is their plan. And Glimmerhold, you can see. Get some information about what they're doing. They have a special room down the uh, West Wing. So they're going to do token operation because of the nostalgia factor. They like the tokens they think will contribute to the nostalgia well, rather so than cards, and, and it's going to be uh, high-priced. So one thing, you know, I'm, I'm going to go into the token versus tickets versus... Um, uh, so okay, we, quickly. Real quickly. So we get called to an arcade to just do a quick consult, and then they ask us, oh, you know, on the card swipe system, you know, what are, we, what are the reasons we should go? We love seeing the kids with the tickets and the tokens, and the first comment out of my mouth and the person I was with was like, we could tell you $13,000 worth of reasons why you want to switch. I'm like, well, what do you mean? So doing an evaluation, they were spending $13,000 on tickets and tokens a year. A se not a year, a season, six-month period. The card system, once you get off, you eliminate all that, the tokens, buying the tickets, having labor to empty ticket eaters, stocking machines, clearing jams, what have you. So this card reader, this, these card reader systems really, really benefit and, and really reduce costs when you're operating machines. Yeah, Apex across the street has swipe cards. Oh, ma imagine this. I mean, a Redemption Arcade when we grew up, you had to have, what, one, two people at the prize counter, somebody walking the floor to handle coin jams and filling tickets, right? I have a Redemption Arcade at a very busy resort. Do you know how many people work at that resort? Correct. I have nobody at that resort. I have a card system and an automated redemption machine that reports back to me. I go by once a day, fill the machine, take care of the card system. Okay. We now, left. just a quick thing. Yeah, we can. Real quick. You just notice what he said. He goes to that location once a day. Or once a, one, once, every, a day. once a day. Once a day. So he's seven days a week working one location where he for has to drive weeks. out for 12 <laughs> weeks. So that's why we were talking about the pinball factor and being able to maintain and do, well, while it's Tuesday, why is my machine dirty? Well, because we service it once a week on a Wednesday because of, you know, the time factor. Okay, let's... Mm -hmm. I was just wondering yeah. uh, along the either counting money, do you guys just have your machines to count money, and have you guys ever used pay range? Pay range. That's more of a UK thing, I thought. I'm old school. I count it by hand. <laughs> Quick coin. <laughs> Quick coin? Yeah, put it in a hopper with quarters, change, it goes into a, what they call a Quick coin counter. It goes through, it puts it in stacks, boy, and what have you. And most of it's by hand. I got a, I got one of those big old clop counters that roll, counts yeah, and rolls it. Yeah, clop's another one. Old yep. fashioned. Yep. Okay. How about the dollar bills? Dollar bills, they have a what we call a dollar sorter. We put it on, it counts for. We always double check the money because of, they do have a tendency to spit bills out and miscount. So, but most of it's done by hand. Okay, uh, last call for questions. Uh, I want to take one more quote. Uh, so in the survey from the trade magazine, they asked operators about the future. Uh, so the operators generally uh, were summarized to be looking for yet more money in jukebox revenue, successful dart leagues, new locations, which we certainly talked about, new employees, well, if you can get them, and growing pinball interest. So this year in the operator survey, that was something that, that bubbled up, and, and I think that's very refreshing. I think it's been a long time since the operators have, and, and Michael, you're probably seeing that same thing. That, that in fact, we're working with Stern <coughs> Pinball and uh, operator friends are working that are in the AMOA, as Dave is, 
a member, uh, we are incentives to join. This is a six month free trial to join the AMOA, which gives you the opportunity to have representation in your, in your state and federal government, uh, learn what's, what's new and hot, what all the trends are, and have that, uh, that information and that camaraderie of other fellow professional uh, operators. So we're encouraging all enthusiast operators, <coughs> folks like Mitch and Dave, who started as a you know, pitball enthusiast into a collector, it's, oh my goodness, I got too many games, what do I do with it? They're gonna put one in the bowling alley, all of a sudden, before you know it, you're an operator. Uh, so, uh, it, pinball is hot, and uh, mm. locations are seeing uh, mm. the benefits. Yeah, and, and if you're not quite sure about when you wanna start your six months trial of AMOA, first thing you can do is subscribe to Replay, and you know get that for a while, and kinda of see, see where pinball seems to be getting uh, it's certain quota of exposure and attention from operators, but there's several other game types. So if you're a pinball enthusiast, you do have to think about, am I someday going to cross that line and change well, the mix? And the other thing is, if you get involved with the AMOA, they have a show every year as well. Um, I believe this coming year is going to be March. I'm not sure on the dates right off the top yeah. of my head, but I know it's in Las Vegas again. And, well... Everybody likes to play the brand new pinball machines. How would you like to go play Venom and not have to wait behind anybody else? Yeah. I won't, I won't and it's like uh, the week, at, at week Moa, before TPF. I got to play, I don't know how many pinball games there because everybody there is looking at everything and they're not full of pinball enthusiasts. So you could play, you know, half a dozen games back to back to back to back without moving pretty easily. Um, but the other thing is you're going to meet with all of the other types of industries that you're going to want to be involved. I mean, let's face it. How many businesses right now are starting to not take cash at all? Oh. It's happening. Yeah. It is happening. So if you're thinking of operating, you're going to want to pay attention to options that allow you to take credit cards, Apple Pay, Google Pay, any other methods. You're going to want to be able to do it. doesn't mean you have to push all your business there because you want to make them cash and try to get as much cash as you can but if you take it off the table that's 20% or 30% of your revenue that before that customer even spent a dime walked out the door you know if a person walks into your arcade and they have $20 in their pocket they put it in a token machine get $20 worth of tokens but what if they have a deal and you can get $50 you spend $50 and get like $80 worth of tokens and you take credit cards, but they still only have that $20 in their wallet. They might take that deal, put $50 in, get the extra tokens, play longer, spend more money with you, but it was because they had the card. Okay. Uh, well, I think we've got a good example here of camaraderie among operators and uh, cooperation. So, uh, you know, it's not all as cutthroat as uh, some movies might portray it. But, uh, <laughs> not anymore. Yeah, no, not it anymore. Is, it has changed over the past Not for the most decade. part. We tend to get along for the most part. Yeah, well, you, you have to. All right, uh, we could do this again in future years and uh, talk more about the arcade side, but I think I uh, wanted to start out with talking about operating... Uh, on locations that have other businesses and you're just an ancillary part of it because I think that's where people enter. That's where I entered. You know, I started out with one used pinball machine and one new foosball machine that was under $1,000 back then and just sort of worked my way up and, you know, from part-time to not quite so part-time. Uh, so that's a, a dream that a lot of people have, especially if they already own the machines. I, I and now you have, two. yeah, now you have more of a <laughs> orientation to what your next few steps would be if you were going to try to be one of that type of operator. So thanks everybody for coming. Hope you liked it.